I'm Doug Arnold. I'm the director of the Institute for Mathematics and its Applications. And I'm delighted to welcome you to the first lecture in our series, Math Matters, for the year 2005-2006. This year, I'm delighted that our season opener is Phil Holmes. Philip Holmes was born and educated in England. He got his bachelor's degree from Oxford in 1967. Then follows a period of three years that is described somewhat poetically on his CV as self-employed man of letters traveling in Europe and the Far East. <laughs> After that, he returned to England and obtained his PhD in engineering from Southampton University in 1973. Part engineer, part mathematician, part poet, Phil didn't exactly fit in anywhere in the British academic system. And so in uh, 1973 or 1977, he joined the brain drain from the UK to the US and uh, came to Cornell University, where he spent the largest period of his career, 20 years. And at Cornell, he rose through the ranks. He uh, left there as a chair and professor of engineering and of mathematics. He had served as the director of the Center for Applied Mathematics. And in 1994, he moved to Princeton University, where he is now as a professor of mechanics and applied mathematics. He's directed Princeton's program in uh, applied and computational mathematics uh, for several years. And he's a currently a member there of the Center for the Study of Brain, Mind, and Behavior. Phil Holmes works in the area of mathematics that's called nonlinear dynamics. That means that he creates ma mathematical models and uses them to analyze systems that move, that oscillate, that vibrate, that somehow change in time. As one of the foundational contributors to chaos theory, his view of the world is very often to emphasize how complexity arises out of the interaction of a lot of simple constituents. And one of the hallmarks of his work is to take the complicated phenomena and to find simple mathematical models that capture much of its essence uh, in a way that gives us some understanding, some ability to predict, some ability to control. He's authored or co-authored close to 200 papers and four mathematical books, including what's really the classic textbook on dynamical systems. Phil Holmes is a true polymath. And the meaning of that is that he excels well in fields other than math. He's authored four books of poetry, and won awards for his uh, work in poetry. And in fact, we had a really beautiful poetry reading in the English department this afternoon. For his mathematics, Phil has been awarded in many ways. He held the Eisenstadt Chair in the Centre of Recherche in Montreal uh, in 1985 86. In 1988-1989, uh, he was a Sherman Fairchild Distinguished Scholar at Caltech. He held a Guggenheim Fellowship in 93-94. And in 1994, he was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. In 2001, the Hungarians caught wind, and he became an honorary member of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. We at the Institute for Mathematics and its Applications take a small amount of credit for some of uh, Phil's most exciting work. Uh, at a 1998 workshop at our institute on animal locomotion, Phil uh, made contact with um, other in mathematicians, engineers, and particularly someone he'd never met before, Bob Full, a biologist from Berkeley who studied insect locomotion. That started off a collaboration involving the mathematicians, biologists, engineers, which has had spectacular results already and is continuing in full swing. Their work has not only made remarkable contributions to understanding how animals move, or as Phil likes to put it, why cockroaches always get away. He's also resulted in some unbelievable six-legged robots. You can see them on the web if you type in Rex, R-H-E-X, that have unprecedented mobility, have already been commercialized, and in fact may be sent on a mission to Mars. <laughs> well, when oscillators interact, complexity can emerge from simplicity. And that's one way to think about what goes on in our brain. <coughs> The dynamics of systems of neurons is a subject that's fascinated Phil going back over 20 years, at least to when he bumped into a neuroscientist at the waiting line at the copy machine, and it resulted in a study of how uh, neurons uh, set up the patterns of swimming in lamprey yields. He's worked in this area on and off for a long time, and now it's probably his major, one of his major directions of work. And so it's our treat tonight to hear Dr. Phil Holmes explain to us how math is helping us to begin to understand the workings of the brain. So Phil, just how does math matter to gray matter?
So, so I slightly changed the title, it won't matter. Um, but yes, this is a talk about, uh, about some of what goes on in the brain and uh, some of the ways in which mathematics can help us begin to approach and understand this, this fascinating organ which makes our lives worthwhile. Uh, so much of the work I've described, I mean I'm drawing on, on uh, neuroscience is, has a relatively long history, but sort of quantitative neuroscience and the attempts to do modeling has a, a history of just over 50 years. Uh, I'm drawing on a lot of that history, but I'm also drawing on the work of, of, of my students, uh, in particular Eric Brown and Duan Gao, a group of postdoctoral fellows, former and present, so Ralph Kogach, Jeff Mullis, Pat Simon, and my colleague and neighbor and friend Jonathan Cohen. Uh, this is one of his uh, MRI, fMRI images. Of course, some of you who are visiting the IMA are involved in, in what looks like a wonderful workshop on imaging and, and, and sense, sensory processing this week. And I had the pleasure of listening to a lecture by one of the uh, Minnesota faculty, <laughs> Dr. Kevin Ugerville, on uh, high magnetic field resonance imaging. This talk is going to be decorated with occasional pictures, but it's not going to be about imaging, I'm afraid. So, uh, what is it about? Well, this is what I'd like to, to do for you tonight, in about 50 minutes or so. Give you a little bit of background, uh, neurobiological uh, and physiological. Talk a little bit about the constituents of brains. Uh, and then, uh, in two parts, tell you something about the ways in which mathematics can help us understand and, and uh, approach the brain. I should ask, is, is the sound system good? Can everybody hear at the back? Okay? Yes? Good. good. Um, so the first, the first part will be to do with decisions, well, simple decisions and behaviors. And the sort of mathematical subtitle is making the most of a stochastic process, uh, interpreting noisy data. And the second part will be going deeper down to smaller scales and looking at the spikes, the action potentials generated by single neurons and how we model those and how we can understand how groups of neurons can collaborate to send signals which will release neurotransmitters. So the subtitle is let them molecules go. And the morals are that mathematics and, uh, uh, neuro mathematical and neurobiological models will be drawn at the end. And of course, if you want to leave early, then you should just leave with the message that yes, well, you bet mathematics. <laughs> so uh, this is a rather formidable slide. It's supposed to give you a, a, an impression of the complexity and the multi-scales in the brain. So here we have a number of pictures of the ingredients, of which we have about 100 billion neurons. Um, now, they are electrically active cells, and so here's the cell, here's the, the, the nucleus and the cell body, and here is a slightly larger scale image uh, showing a number of cells, and here is another image produced by a different method in which the cell bodies and their long axonal processes and their dendrites are, are stained so that they show up. Here's another picture which is actually redrawn from a stained picture. And so, these are, in fact, single cells. Here's a schematic drawing. They're single cells, but they have an extremely long process coming out of the northern axon, which is a sort of transmission line. And the axon of one cell will synapse on, come close to, connect with the dendrites of another cell. And through these synaptic connections, <coughs> messages are transmitted via the release of neurotransmitters. And so the single cell itself, if take a small scale view is already a pretty complicated object. And the network of many cells is even more complicated. And perhaps what is more most striking about these numbers is that the number of connections is exceeds the number of neurons by a factor of about a thousand or so. There are a lot of connections in the brain. Not as many dollars are as there are in the national debt, but still quite a lot. <laughs> On a slightly larger scale, Neurons are arranged into areas in the brain and into layers and folds. And so here are some slices through the visual cortex showing different layers of neurons. Basically, the neuron density is differing, and that's what we're seeing here. Uh, these layers have, of course, been studied for many years. They've been given names and numbers. 
And not only do we have this layered structure, a columnar structure, a layered structure, but different brain areas have been identified, um, primarily, initially through physiology, through basically through, through examining disease and damaged brains, uh, but more recently through techniques such as functional magnetic resonance imaging. This is a, an image, well, a dark image of a slice in which four areas are simultaneously active during the, uh, the, the execution of a cognitive task. So one can now begin to probe living, living brains. Um, with animal studies, one can also make direct recordings of electrical impulses that these neurons are propagating down their, down their axons. And so the, the sort of currency of communication is spikes or more scientifically action potentials. And spikes can be also arranged in, into bursts. So a single spike is a rather stereotypical rise, sudden rise, and then drop in voltage, followed by a so-called refractory or quiet period while the neuron recovers before it can pump out another spike. But spike, so a spike itself is often thought of as a sort of digital piece of information. It's zero if it's not spiking, it's one if it's spiking. Uh, but the way spikes are arranged can be extremely complex. Here's an irregular spike train. The neuron begins spiking, and the spike rate gradually drops off. Here is a different kind of neuron which emits regular bursts, but they also have a typical signature. Again, this rapid spiking which, which gradually drops off and then stops, and then a long refractory period, and then more spiking. These are actually uh, muscle cells. These are uh, EMG, electromyographs, uh, of uh, muscles contracting rhythmically in uh, a, an insect, in fact, in, a, in a, an escaping cockroach. Uh, and here what's interesting is the, the uh, periodic patterns as the legs move and the, the phase differences between different legs which are moving in a particular pattern. So the currency of communication is spikes. So there you saw some multiple spatial scales. <coughs> now I want to say something about multiple time scales, primarily. <coughs> the phenomena, some of which we saw on the last slide, um, involve spikes at, at slightly longer time scales, in the order of milliseconds. These spikes take from one to five milliseconds. They're very short, sharp events. Um, over slightly longer time scales, we can talk about the rate of spiking. If we go back to the previous picture, we can say that the high spike rate here is a low spike rate here. Um, at a slightly longer time scale, we talk about bias currents, which are influencing the spike rates of groups of neurons. We talk about neurotransmitter release. And at a longer time scale, we talk about weight changes in the synapses, and we actually probably know that after neurological damage, um, patients can recover function, and that involves essentially the growth of neurons and the, the, the growth of new synaptic connections. And when we learn new things, we in fact change synaptic weights or make new connections. And that, of course, takes place over longer time scales and hopefully over all of our lives. So the time scales here go from milliseconds to lifetimes, and these are three sort of well, caricature questions. These are the kind of questions I'm going to be addressing in this talk. Uh, dodging the traffic. Should I cross the road now? The questions which have to be answered, hopefully correctly, within half a second or so. Um, but uh, we also have slightly longer term questions. When should I cash in and, and uh, or, or should I keep going and lose the rest of my life? Uh, and, and we have questions that perhaps really change our lives. So, will it be applied math, neuroscience, or functional studies, or what should I do? So, uh, to, along with these different timescales, go, one would say this is enormously complicated. As, as, as Doug mentioned in the introduction, um, I've been interested for a long time in how simple systems collaborate to be complicated, but I'm also interested in how complicated systems can be picked apart, and, and the timescales allow us to pick them apart because there are different mathematical techniques that operate at different timescales. I'm going to focus on two of these. The first part of the lecture will, will concern what are called drift diffusion equations and 
prediction methods for, for predicting stochastic processes, random processes. And the, the uh, second part of the lecture will, will concern ordinary differential equations for modeling individual spikes. And so uh, I'll try to give you in this lecture a little bit of a survey of how mathematics can uh, contribute to both macro scale and longer time scale events and to micro scale events. And I'll uh, indicate that there's a big gap in between, which seems to me to be one of the big challenges in, in theoretical neuroscience, to sort of bridge this gap. So here's a sort of caricature of my view, at any rate, of what neuroscience is. At the moment, it is mostly, and has been mostly, a painstaking accumulation of detail. It's really been a matter of differentiating all these different neuron types, different types of connections, different brain areas. What is beginning to be is what we're beginning to see now is that we can begin to assemble these parts into a whole. And so differentiation and integration. Well, what does math do well? Well, <laughs> we know how to do that, right? <laughs> so let's go. The first part then is decisions and behavior or making the most of stochastic process. And it is going to be literally about integration. And the underlying hypothesis uh, is that human and animal behaviors have evolved to be optimal or nearly optimal. And there is significant evidence for this in, in, in uh, insect and uh, animal sensory systems in which there are dedicated neurons, dedicated in, in the case uh, of this beautiful series of papers by Bill Bialik and his colleagues on uh, the, the, the fruit fly steering system. How do flies figure out how to steer and navigate? Well, they have to use uh, input, uh, visual input from their eyes, they have motion detectors pretty close to the, to the sort of input of visual information. And these are dedicated cells that are selectively responsive to leftward or rightward motion. And these are used to essentially to measure angular velocities as, as the fly flies around. And these are used to make course corrections. And uh, Bill has been able to show that um, these particular neural circuits work pretty close to the theoretical limits of information transition, transmission using Shannon's information theory. So we're going to apply similar ideas to the following really simple decision task. And I'm going to turn you all into uh, subjects in an experiment in a moment. So this is what we tell our subjects in, in Cohen's lab. On each trial, you will be shown one of two stimuli. You must identify the direction, left or right, in which the majority of these dots will move. When I hit the button, the dots will start moving. Um, and so the task is, so I can vary the coherence of the stimulus. This will be a relatively high coherence stimulus. 30% of the dots will either be moving to the left or to the right. In this case, it will be a low coherence stimulus. Um, and every time you make a correct decision, you'll be rewarded. Uh, I'm going to uh, make you do this for uh, 10 minutes, uh, and uh, then you'll stop. And so um, you've got to maximize, your, your task is to maximize your reward. So you have to be fast, and you have to be accurate. But those, of course, are conflicting requirements. So let's go. So, so I'll hit this one, and, and if, if, the dot, if you think the majority of the dots are moving to the right, you should raise your right hand, right? So that's, the, that's that hand, if you're sitting where you are. And, and if you think the majority are moving to the left, you should raise your left hand, and you should do it as soon as you're pretty sure. You can decide how sure you want to be. Good, good, good. About uh, two or three hundred milliseconds, and, and the, pretty much everybody goes right. They are moving to the right. <laughs> a little bit slower, a little bit slower, and a few left hands are up there, so you guys don't get the rewards, but the right hand get the rewards, and then, yes, they are moving right. But, you see, it's noisy. There's more noise, and noise is the fact that the other dots are moving in other directions, but let's, let's do that one again. 
No, I'm telling you where they're going, so. <laughs> well, still, some of you still think it's left. <laughs> some of them are going left, but not most of them. <laughs> so, so this illustrates that, um, you know, depending on the signal-to-noise ratio, you might want to have a different strategy. You might want to spend longer thinking about it before you answer so you have a better chance of being correct. But the longer you spend thinking about it, the more time you're using up. So if you're, there's some high school students here, I believe, this is the strategy for the SATs, you know. Do you, are you fast or are you accurate? Well, you're supposed to be both. You know, if you're gonna get an 800, then, then you have to be fast and accurate. Uh, so there's a speed accuracy trade-off to be solved. Well, we, so we do experiments like this, uh, and uh, there are behavioral measures, the reaction time, and the distribution of reaction times, and the error rates are the key behavioral signatures of how this task is being performed. And of course, this is a very simple task, and there isn't much writing on it, uh, although if you're a subject in our experiments, you know, you get 10 cents for every correct decision, and, and so you walk out of the lab with a bit more money, and the overall winner gets 100 bucks. So, there's something writing on it. But many more complex decisions are being made with noisy data by your investment brokers or the TIAA craft people who are managing our pensions or, or the state of Minnesota retirement. So decisions like this are being made all the time. So although this is a simple example, it's, uh, I think, somewhat relevant. So now, here comes the first bit of mathematics. So there is, for this problem, there is an optimal strategy. And here it, is. it was discovered uh, during the Second World War. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the people who discovered it. Uh, it's called the sequential probability ratio test. And this is the mathematical idealization of the task that we just did. Um, what you're doing, what, what, I, what I did when I hit the button, was to give you a distribution or, or samples, repetitive samples from a distribution. It was either this distribution, that corresponds to dots going right, or this distribution that was corresponding to dots going left. And you have to decide from which of those distributions the samples were being drawn, the samples being the frames of the movie that we were just shown. So this SPRT, sequential positive ratio test, works like this. And you set up two thresholds, one over B and B, so one is the inverse of the other, and you keep a running tally of the ratio or, uh, or actually, as a product of likelihood, this is a type of excuse me, a product of likelihood ratios. So uh, that means that I, I uh, take a sample and it's here. So it looks more likely that it's in the red distribution than the blue distribution because the ratio of, uh, uh, of uh, p left over p right would be smaller than one. Here. The blue curve is below the red curve. So it looks more likely that it's from the red distribution. Okay. But, you know, one sample might be an error. Uh, so take another one. Oh, good, it looks even more like it. Take another one. Oh, but then now it looks, you know, I get some occasional distributions in the tail, so now it looks, for this, this one, the blue is more likely than the red. So you have to take enough of these to get a reasonable idea. And the sequential probability ratio test says that this is the most efficient way of doing it. So you can take the product of these ratios, and as soon as that product either exceeds B or falls below 1 over B, you declare victory for either red or left, or, or, or right or left, depending upon which, whether it went one way or the other. Uh, and the, the piece of mathematics behind this says that among all possible ways in which you could think of solving this problem would be a fixed number of samples, either watching it for a fixed time or allowing this, this, this so-called free response, uh, respond when you're ready protocol. Among, among all possible strategies, this one will minimize the expected number of observations to achieve a given accuracy. So it's the best way of solving this problem. So before I go on and do another little piece of mathematics, let me just tell you a word or two about the, the, uh, the names here. Um, Abraham Walt was a, a uh, Polish, uh, sorry, a Hungarian refugee, Jewish refugee, who was, uh, came to the United States in the late 30s and, and was working with a statistical research group at, the at Columbia University during the Second World War. And, um, he was introduced to this problem by a, a young uh, 
man who was a graduate student at that time called Milton Friedman. He became a famous pun on the subject. And Milton Friedman had, had been, was part of a group that was actually doing, doing war research for, for uh, the Aberdeen Proving Ground, the, the uh, US Army's uh, Ordnance uh, Research Center in Maryland. And they'd been asked to devise a, a reliable statistical test which could be applied to determine whether or not some new design of artillery shells was better than the previous one. And rather than shooting off a thousand of these shells, they wanted to shoot off only as many as we need to. And so he came up with this idea, but he couldn't prove that it was optimal. Wald uh, solved the problem, proved the theorem, and, it's, uh, and, and began to write, write up a paper. But this was uh, secret work, and he didn't have security clearance. He was a European refugee. And so the story goes that every page that he wrote of his paper was taken away from him after he'd read it, because he wasn't allowed to read it. <laughs> so his, his paper appeared finally in 1947. Uh, but this was work done in the war. And, and at the same time, uh, uh, George Barnard in the United Kingdom uh, essentially proved the same theorem. And his work was used by Alan Turing and his colleagues at Bletchley Park to crack the German Enigma code. Um, and uh, uh, because again, they, they had to, uh, they had to uh, do a certain amount of guesswork in trying to find keys to the code and then decode, and they wanted to have a reliable estimate of whether they, they've made a good decision. And Barnard, uh, but for a, a chance series of occurrences, might not have been a statistician. He, in fact, had come to Princeton in the 1930s wanting to do a thesis in logic with Alonzo Church. And uh, again, the story goes that he uh, would go to try to meet Church, and he would go to Church's office door, and Church was always inside talking. So Barnard assumed he always had somebody with him, and he never managed to get an interview with, with uh, Church. And, his first year at Princeton, and then the war was looming, and he went back to England, and, and uh, he discovered later that church, church just talked to himself, and there was nobody in his office. <laughs> so, so uh, let me move on uh, to a uh, a little uh, mathematical interlude, a dance, uh, a double dance. Uh, if you take that problem that I just did, which involved all the products and you take logarithms, well logarithms are wonderful because they turn multiplication into addition, which is a lot easier. And then, we'll do something that might seem to be harder, we take a continuum of limits in which addition becomes integration. Uh, and that turns the, the uh, sequential probability ratio test into a drift diffusion process, which is one of the sort of cornerstones of, of, uh, of physics um, ever since, in fact, uh, one of Einstein's miraculous year papers about diffusion and Brownian motion. Um, the drift diffusion problem, so, so this is a stochastic differential equation, and let me decode it for you. It says that the increment in x is equal to a constant times the increment in t, so this would just give us constant linear increase in time. If you just have this, we'd be sort of adding one little unit of information per unit of time. Uh, but in drawing from a noisy distribution, we're also giving a random perturbation either in one direction or the other direction. So we've also got random perturbation added at the same time. Well, x is a logarithm of this ratio that we had in the previous slide, the ratio here. Um, and so now we have to take logarithms of, of the uh, boundaries of, of our thresholds, and then the rule becomes whenever x reaches either a threshold of z or minus z, we declare the winner. <coughs> so this is a, a, a very pretty little mathematical model, a very simple model about which we know quite a lot. It's been analyzed to death. So the question now is, well, do humans or monkeys or rats drift and diffuse? Well, there is evidence now from three sources, behavioral evidence, neuronal evidence, and evidence from mathematical models. So first, let me show you some behavioral evidence. A human reaction times to the kind of task that you just did um, can be plotted, and they can be fitted extremely well to first passage threshold passing times of a drift diffusion process. So here I'm going to show you uh, 10 uh, simultaneously plotted solutions of that simple drift diffusion process. You, you should interpret this in the following way, that the, you're viewing, say, uh, right-going 
Professor McCullough of Elders left. Uh, left going stimuli, and so the, the drift term, which is telling you from which distribution you're drawing, is in fact upwards, but occasionally noise will push you downwards. These are the two thresholds, and so a typical <coughs> run of this process will, will give you a ragged looking line that goes a curve that goes up and crosses <coughs> the correct threshold, or occasionally one that goes down and crosses the incorrect threshold. And the threshold crossing times uh, will be um, distributed in a random fashion. So here we go, and you can see that this guy looks like he's going bad, the others uh, are all crossing the correct threshold, and here's one incorrect, you can tend to send error or something. And here's the distribution of passage times that would emerge from running many, many trials. And the observation here, made by uh, Roger Ratcliffe and many others in, in, in the psychological literature, after, basically after, after uh, discovering the sequential probability ratio test, is that in fact, this data, the human data in human reaction time distributions can be fitted pretty well to this model. And as I said, it's a rather simple model. There are just one, <coughs> two, three parameters, the drift rate, the noise strength, and a threshold to fit. So it's a simple model of what might seem to be a rather complicated distribution of data. So that's some behavioral evidence. But that's at a pretty high level, it's at the level of behavior. It doesn't go into the brain at all. So the next evidence goes into the brain. It goes into direct neural recordings from different brain areas in monkeys <coughs> who are doing this task, actually looking at those moving dots. So here are recordings from two different groups. Um, the, the activity in, in, in terms of the spike rate of a group of neurons in uh, an area called the frontal eye field in monkeys who are viewing this moving off stimulus, and you see here three recordings from uh, tr trials, and you see something very much like those, those noisy, rising uh, solutions in the drift diffusion process. And here's another one from a different group. Uh, these are averaged over many trials, but they're done with different coherences, and so here, here's the low coherence signal, and there's a break in it middle here because the low coherence signals take much longer to get to threshold, as most of you did, and some of you of course went a long way. Um, the high coherence signals get to threshold rather faster, and, and the, the key point about these pictures is that there is a more or less constant threshold, which once the firing rate of this group, the group of neurons gets to the threshold, inevitably a behavioral event is produced. The monkey, in this case, saccades rapidly moves its eyes to, to one of two targets on the screen, and the monkey delivers either a correct or an incorrect decision. And so there is some behavior that is evoked at this particular point. And so again, that's pretty strong evidence that there is something like a drift diffusion process going on. Uh, the third um, piece of evidence comes more indirectly from a mathematical model in which one thinks of two groups of neurons, one of them sensitive to left-going stimuli and the other sensitive to right-going stimuli, and such neurons can be identified by direct recordings, which are competing with each other. And so there are two of these little stochastic differential equations with an inhibition, mutual inhibition, the competition term. Uh, so here I'll show you the phase plane of, these, uh, of, of the, this process. So these are the, the Y1 neurons are, 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 are uh, uh, preferentially sensitive, say, to right-going stimuli. The Y2 neurons are preferentially sensitive to left-going stimuli. And on a given trial, one group of neurons is going to eventually win by crossing either the left-going threshold and signaling the left, or by crossing the right-going threshold and signaling the right. Uh, so let's run this. So we're now running 100 trials, so when they cross threshold, they change color, so these are all signaling lefts, but we've got a few red guys who sig signal um, rights, so the majority are making the correct decision. And what you see in this simulation is that after a short initial period, let's, let's run it again, um, um, they, they sort of settle down in a distribution around this line. And along this line, we have 
essentially a drift diffusion process for the difference, for the difference in, um, in uh, signals, which is the likelihood ratio. So this is the, the realization of the likelihood ratio of computation. So we might say, okay, maybe drift diffusion process is a reasonable model, but um, why did we talk about drift diffusion? Well, it turned out to be the continuum limit of something which is optimal. So do humans, monkeys, or rats actually optimize? Well, here's the, again, the mathematical <coughs> translation of, of, of the task that you did. Uh, you were supposed to maximize your rewards for, uh, 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 on, on a succession of trials run over a fixed period. So uh, I showed you a stimulus, you had a reaction time, you then responded, and there was a delay which I can impose, I can make you wait for the next trial. So that's a parameter under the experimenter's control. And the signal to noise ratio, the coherence, is another parameter under the experimenter's control, or at least partly under the experimenter's control. So your task is to maximize the reward rate, which is the average the percentage of, of, of correct answers divided by the average time for response. So it's 1 minus the error rate divided by the reaction time, the time that you actually take to make the decision, plus this delay which I uh, impose on Well, you could sort of see intuitively, if you set your threshold too low, if you answer your SAT questions too quickly, you'll get a lot of them answered, but you'll make a lot of mistakes. You won't get so many rewards. On the other hand, if you set your threshold too high and you spend the first 15 minutes on number one, you get bright maybe, but you're not going to do very much. And so you also get a low reward. And there must be somewhere in the middle an optimal, uh, you know, there must be a good strategy, which is spending just the right length of time, but not too long, and getting enough of the questions right. Well, actually, of course, that's just uh, an intuitive idea. It's like the so-called NAFA curve in economics. If the taxation rate is 100%, uh, then nobody works because you're not going to work with the the government. If it's 0%, then the government gets nothing. And so there must be a sort of optimum in the middle. Well, I mean, there might be many. It might be a multimodal curve. Well, in this case, it's not. It's a unimodal curve. And why do we know that? Well, because we can actually solve the drift diffusion equation. And we can calculate the mean reaction time we can calculate the error rate, and we can, then, we can substitute those into the reward rate, and then we have a graph with an explicit expression for reward rate as a function of threshold. So we can compute what the optimal threshold is, what the optimal speed accuracy trade-off is. In particular, these parameters, the, the threshold, the drift rate, noise strength, they, they show up only in two combinations, so we really have two sort of system parameters, and then we have the experimenter imposed delay. And so this curve, there's really one of these curves, but for each value of D, there's a family of these curves. So we can express the reaction time, and it turns out we, we can then sort of combine these formulas in a nice way. We can, uh, we can say, well, if we're being optimal, then giving data, giving the signal to noise ratio tells us what the threshold should be. Uh, and that, in turn, with a beautiful piece of mathematical <coughs> coincidence, allows us to write a very simple expression for the reaction time, the mean reaction time, divided by the total delay, by the average time on, on, spent on, on, on task, uh, is a unique parameter-free function of the error rate an optimal performance curve. And this, I think, is the first example of a theoretically derived optimal performance curve. So if humans are optimal, they should sit right on this curve. So let me talk you through the curve a little bit. At this end, the error rate is zero. And so this end corresponds to uh, stimuli which are so clear, so discriminable, so easily read, that you get them right every time and you barely have to think about it. Your, your reaction time is almost zero, your error rate is almost zero. At this end, the stimuli is so noisy, the dots are moving in all directions, there's really no coherence at all, you're never going to get any information out of this, and so you might as well guess immediately, and you'll be right half the time. So again, your reaction time should be zero, your error rate will be quite fine. And by 
the experiment of moving through this parameter space, he can force uh, uh, subjects to work anywhere on this curve. If they are optimal, they should be on that curve. So are people optimal? Well, this is a histogram taken from data from 80 subjects, Princeton undergraduates mostly. Um, and if you look at all the subjects, you find that a significant fraction of them are spending much longer on the task than they should. They're trying to be accurate. And it's to their disadvantage because they're not doing enough trials to make much money, even though they're being accurate when they do respond. But something like 30% are, are within, are well within one standard, actually within half a standard deviation of this curve. They're doing very well. The others are not. So why not? This, this, so, so this, I mean, this already answers the question. It, it says that, yes, some people are very close to optimal, but some are not. Why not? Well, could they be optimizing a different function? For example, could they be more concerned with being right than being rewarded? Or are they trying to optimize, but they're just unable to do it? They can't adjust their threshold. Well, I'm not going to have time to tell you much about that today. <laughs> But I will be able to tell you a little bit about the optimizing a different function. But the, 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 the moral for the moment is that the mathematical theory delivers very precise predictions, parameter-free predictions. Its successes and its failures generate other interesting questions and suggest new experiments. It's a way of getting really down and deep and dirty with the data. So, as I said, we, we can fit the whole of the data somewhat better by producing a family of performance curves in which we have a weight for accuracy. And so if you want to be right more than you want to be rewarded, then you work on one of these curves that is higher up. And you can, psychologists have in fact proposed theories of this kind in the past. But in my view, that it fits the data better, but what does it explain? It, it says, okay, there is a variety, of, there are a variety of people out there with different priorities. Okay, that's fine. We sort of knew that. So, nonetheless, an interesting uh, question, uh, an interesting uh, <laughs> sign up. But uh, the bottom line of this part of the talk is that too much accuracy is bad for your bottom line. Or, now, actually, a very simple piece of calculus, the subtitle of this talk is the rewards of calculus, a very simple piece of calculus comes into this, and that's the, the question of choosing a threshold. Your sub people can behave suboptimally either by being reckless, by making decisions that are too fast, by making more errors, or they could be suboptimal by being too conservative, by being too accurate. And most of the subjects in this, in this trial were being too accurate in this sequence of experiments. Could that be a rational choice? Which type of behavior leads to smaller losses? And just the shape of this curve shows you, if, you're, if you make a, 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 I couldn't somehow, the, the, the digital discrimination of the, the Bill Gates didn't allow me to position these curves symmetrically, but this is supposed to be uh, an equal amount above and an equal amount below. If you're setting the threshold and you make an error, because the curve of the, the uh, actually the third derivative here is, is non-zero, the, the curve falls more slowly on this side than on that side, and so you, 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 you give up less in rewards, uh, uh, you give up more in rewards when you set the threshold too low than you do when you set the threshold too high. And so, in fact, it, it makes sense to make errors on this side. So one could say that uh, these people were trying to maximize, and they realized that even if they couldn't, it would be better to be conservative than to be reckless. There's no political message in this. <laughs> okay. Uh, the second part of the talk, let me move now to uh, part two. Preparing for that, uh, I want to say a word about how thresholds which in this first part of the talk were just parameters in some mathematical model, what that actually corresponds to in the brain. And it corresponds, as we saw, to groups of neurons firing, firing rates of groups of neurons getting to a threshold. 
Um, so how, are, how is the threshold crossing detected? Well, it's basically detected by, by having a, a, a little neural circuit which has a, an input and output sort of response curve that looks something like this. The, the input uh, leads to an output, and if the output is pretty steep, then it's almost like a switch, like a digital switch, of on and off, zero or one. And the gain of such a device is mediated, modulated by neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitter release can increase gain. And, and specifically, the neurotransmitter norepinephrine is a kind of wake up, pay attention neurotransmitter. It can assist processing and speed response and decision tasks, and thereby collapse the multi-layered brain that we started with to something which looks more like a single, simple, near-optimal BD process. So that leads to my second uh, part, spikes and gain changes, or let them molecules go. So here the underlying hypothesis is that threshold and gain changes in the cortex are mediated by transient spike dynamics in brainstem areas. Um, the transients uh, are determined by inherent circuit properties and the stimuli. So this takes us further down into the brain, and in fact, pretty far down into the brainstem. This little area here, which is appropriately colored blue, is called the locus coeruleus, the blue place. It's got nothing to do with depression. It's a group of cells which in, in, uh, in uh, sections uh, uh, look as if they're colored blue. Um, uh, it's a fairly small nucleus, about 30,000 neurons, 15,000 on each side, it's in two pieces. Uh, but they each make, on the order of a, a quarter of a million synapses with neurons throughout the cortex. So these green arrows indicate uh, uh, connections from LC neurons to cortical neurons. And they release norepinephrine. And the effect of norepinephrine, as I said, is, is like a gain of signal. It's like, an, it's like turning up the volume knob. And these are some data from uh, rats, from uh, Rats live in a world in which their whiskers and what their whiskers touch is very important, so they have a big chunk of cortex devoted to decoding whisker contact. So if you poke a rat's or vibrate a rat's whisker in a stereotypical fashion, and the norepinephrine levels in its cortex are low, you don't get much response, you just get a little cloud of spikes. If you do it when the norepinephrine levels are high, you get much bigger clouds of spikes. The same stimulus, but different responses. That's the effect of norepinephrine release. Now, that's the, the sort of tonic effect of norepinephrine release. Tonic means uh, sort of more or less steady state. Now I want to talk about phasic, time-dependent states. So these are some experiments done by our colleagues in, in uh, the University of Pennsylvania. And what you see here is a, a recording taken from uh, electrodes implanted in locus coeruleus of monkeys who are doing a, a target detection task, rather like the task that you did. They're looking for a particular stimulus that will come on the screen, and they're supposed to respond to one stimulus, but not to respond to the other. Um, and this is over a period of maybe an hour and a half or so. The, the spiking rate of cells in their, in their LC is being monitored. And you see it's high, and then it switches after maybe a thousand seconds or so to a low, and then it switches up to high again, and then to low and high. And what's interesting here is that these periods of, of high and low, which are caricatured with red and green, <coughs> um, are correlated in a very beautiful way with, with errors. And so this is the false alarm rate. It's a rate at which the monkey is making mistakes by identifying the wrong stimulus, responding when it shouldn't. It's about 5% during a period of rapid LC activity, and it goes down to zero in, in a period of, of uh, slightly slower LC activity. So one could say, well, the uh, LC is releasing norepinephrine, so when there's a lot of norepinephrine around, the animal makes mistakes, when there isn't as much, it, 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 sorry, yes, the animal makes mistakes when there's a lot around, but when there isn't as much, it doesn't make mistakes. But it's actually not the steady state level of norepinephrine, and this is more or less steady state on the time scale of the decisions. The decisions are being made in three or four hundred 
milliseconds and these are thousands of seconds, thousands of decisions, it's the transient release that's important. Because when the LC is running rapidly, it gets a stimulus, it releases a little more norepinephrine, the spike rate goes up, but it doesn't go up by much, and then it drops and then it recovers. On the other hand, when it's running at this lower rate, the same stimulus releases a big pulse of spikes, and hence a pulse of norepinephrine. And so it suggests that the transients are crucial. The LC delivers norepinephrine just when it's needed to make for a, a better decision, fewer errors, and also, as I hope to show you, a faster decision. So we set out to model this process, and this led us to um, the, uh, a more detailed examination of individual <laughs> spiking neurons. Um, so I said that mathematical, theoretical neuroscience has had a history of about 50 years or so, and one of the key events in that history was, was a brilliant series of papers that culminated in, 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 a, in a mathematical modeling study in 1952 by Hodgkin and Huxley, won the Nobel Prize. They developed a biophysical model of a single electrically active cell, a single neuron, and they did this on the basis of years worth of very careful experiments, and it's basically an electrical circuit model. It's something that would come out of a, a freshman or sophomore engineering electrical circuit or physics course. The, the inside and the outside of the neuron are, are maintained at a different, with a potential difference between them. Uh, the flow of charged ions through pores and the surface, through channels, uh, controls that potential difference. And it is the, dyna the coupled dynamics of the voltage and the, and the, uh, uh, and the uh, ionic uh, uh, concentrations and the, 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 uh, the uh, gates in the membrane which are opening and closing in a manner that depends upon voltage that controls this, uh, this system, or at least that controls this model of the system. So, there are these beautiful equations for which Hodgkin and Huxley won their prize, but they're really, really complicated. So I want to show you how they can be simplified in the case that the neurons are repetitively spiking, as LC neurons are. There is a record of voltage versus time for a rat neuron from this being taken out of the rat's brain and put in a dish and measured under very careful conditions. And it, it spikes in a very repetitive manner with actually long intervals between the spikes, about three seconds or so. In the live animal, it's a bit faster. Well, that spiking, from the viewpoint of a mathematician who doesn't, I don't like to look at formulae like this very much, probably no more than you do, but I do like to look at pictures. And this is a picture of, that, of, of the consequences of that formula. This is a picture of the solution to the differential equation. It's, it's essentially the same solution that you see here, where you see voltage going up and down with time. It's the kind of trace that you might see if you have to visit a relative in hospital who's hooked up to one of those heart monitor machines, or maybe you watch it yourself if they're doing an EKG on you. But those periodic signals are really following a closed curve in the space of voltage and ionic gating variables. Here's the spike, it shoots up very fast, Voltage increases and then it collapses and then crawls around here and spikes again. And so I can map that onto a circle, onto a plot face effect. I can change to a single variable, beta, which measures the angle of the clock, of, of, of the hand of the clock, a clock with one hand, and the spike occurs at, in, in my picture, three o'clock, and the recovery period takes quite a long time and goes slowly, occurs around 9 o'clock. And that collapses those complicated equations to a very, very simple differential equation. It says that the rate of change of this angle, of this phase angle, is a constant, plus whatever effect the internal material inputs add to it. Well, of course, it's not quite that simple, because the external inputs get filtered through a phase response curve describes how well the cell listens to its environment. And it turns out that it listens quite attentively around 9 o'clock, 
And when it's close to firing, it gets so excited that it doesn't listen to anything that's coming outside from outside, it just fires. And that's reflected by the shape of this curve, which drops to zero close to zero, which is really here, three o'clock in the clock phase, and goes to its maximum at nine o'clock. So here is a little loop <coughs> um, in which there are three uh, things to watch. Here is the stimulus, which I now just turned on. I put a big stimulus on. I'll run this several times so you can see it. Um, and here is the voltage signal. The same picture that you saw earlier. So here's a spike, and here's it's recovering, and here's another spike. And here I'm just logging the spikes by putting ticks. And here's the stimulus turning on. And so what you're supposed to see is that when the stimulus turns on, the average speed around the circle goes up. Uh, but the stimulus has a much bigger effect when it's on the back stretch, which is close to 9 o'clock. And so spike rates go up, and this is essentially a visualization of the solution of this differential equation. So we can find this phase response curve analytically. It's a very simple function. And it tells us that external stimuli speed up the spikes most dramatically at 9 o'clock. So now back to the question of why is it that the slow LC has a big transient response and the fast LC doesn't. So here's a slow LC. Oh, I have this the wrong way around. This is a fast LC. Fast LC has a has a rather weak response. So I apologise for the labels which will disappear in a moment. The wrong label on this. Here's a, a fast LC which has a, a rather weak pulsing response, and here's a slow LC running at about one hertz that has a much faster a much bigger response to, to the same stimulus. And what you see on, on the fast one, which I'll run once more, back for a second, uh, is that when the stimulus is on, these states get all bunched together. So what we have here is a simultaneous solution of many of those equations with a random distribution of phases. There are many cells in the lower screws. They are drawn into phase by the, by the stimulus, and they are drawn into phase to a much higher degree in the slow running case. So the size of this coordination effect depends upon the intrinsic frequency for the tonic LC, which is, which is fast on average. The effect is small. This is 3 hertz, I should have said 3 hertz up there. The, the phasic LC, which is slow on average, has a much bigger phasic effect. So, capitalizing on this, we begin to add more realistic effects to the model. We add noise and we add the fact that these cells are not independent, they're actually coupled. And that produces the same kind of burst effect to the stimulus, but then the cells sort of redistribute themselves, their phases redistribute around the circle, and um, after the stimulus ends, noise and random frequencies redistribute the phases. We see that the, the sort of system has decayed back to, back to baseline and sort of reset itself, ready for the next stimulus. So this kind of approach uh, allowed us to um, match uh, data um, rather beautifully. So here is experimental data which you saw earlier of, of, the, of the tonic LC with its relatively high frequency of small response, and the basic LC with its relatively low average frequency of big response. And these are the simulations. The blue bars are direct simulations of that detailed biophysical model, those equations that we don't like to look at. The uh, uh, thin and solid curves are, are theoretical results that we could get using this phase response technology, which I should point out was developed uh, over, over many years by a number of different mathematicians, including Bart Ehrmantraut and Mark Winfrey, uh, Igor Malkin in, so in the Soviet Union in the 1940s and 50s. So a lot of this is technology that's there in the, in the world of differential equations waiting for us to use. So the conclusions for the second uh, part of the talk are that matching these very stimulus time histograms with the experiments with the model of the theory 
uh, reveals the mechanisms uh, in this neurotransmitter release, that the intrinsic frequency of its variability and the stimulus duration of the key parameters. Slower oscillators deliver bigger coherent bursts. The burst envelopes decay in an exponential fashion, and depressed firing rates follow short stimuli. And so this was a kind of added bonus to the problem. It, it gave us an understanding of this depressed rate. It's not like a single neuron refractory period. It's like a collective phenomenon. A group of neurons have fired, and now the group is the, the probability of firing is depleted. And this, in fact, then led to a prediction that seems to have checked out. There's a fascinating uh, psychological phenomenon called the intentional blink. When you're looking for a particular stimulus in a string of letters, if you see the stimulus, you'll report on it with, with a good chance of accuracy, but if it's flashed up immediately again, you'll miss it. Your attention blinks. And the explanation is, we believe, well, you just, you just shot your load of norepi, you're, you're going to miss that one. So, I'm at the end. Uh, let me summarize. Um, what I, the story I tried to tell you tonight was uh, neural activity in simple decisions is like a drift diffusion process. Uh, and we have a model based on that that predicts optimal speed accuracy trade offs. Um, it explains how, in some abstract sense, threshold adjustments can optimize rewards. Um, the second part of the talk was devoted to showing a potential mechanism for that threshold adjustment, the gain adjustments and the threshold adjustment, by transient neurotransmitter release. <coughs> and uh, I hope I've indicated something about the rather pretty mathematics that was involved here. Um, of course, I've, I've uh, spared you many of the details, but uh, the techniques that go into here are stochastic ordinary differential equations, dynamical systems theory, and a good dose of good old freshman calculus. So I hope I've shown you that there are rewards in calculus. But of course, there's a lot to do. So the morals are that good mathematical models are not just reasonably faithful, they're also approximately soluble. They help us focus and simplify. Thank you very much. I think Phil will take some questions. Sure, I'd be delighted. Not as in that Over here? Yes. I'll ask you a question that might be a little bit off this topic, but with your expertise and knowledge, do you think that sometime, perhaps in the next century, we will make any headway? Do you think that, uh, say, in 100 years, we'll have uh, some type of mathematical or neural network implementation in, in silica that will approximate human beings' intelligence? Uh, interesting. Yes. <laughs> so, of course, we do have um, already implementations of, of, of bits of brain, and of simple tasks, and we have, um, we have uh, artificial cochleas, and we have artificial uh, uh, retinas coming, and, uh, and so certainly pieces of the circuitry can be, can be built. Whether they are built on exactly the same principles or not is maybe a little bit beside the point, because of course all brains are different. I mean, our, our brains have basically the same sort of ingredients and roughly the same number of cells, but uh, you know they come in all different shapes and sizes and weights, and, and um, we literally wire them ourselves as we grow. So there isn't a unique solution to this. There isn't a, no more than, no more than there's a unique human genome is there a unique human brain. So we can already build bits of them. I don't see any sort of theoretical or, or Say there's no rational block that I'm aware of um, uh, uh, to building to building a brain. Um, so could a machine be conscious in the way that we're conscious? I don't see any objection to that. 
I, I don't, you know, I don't think there's anything here except impulses, electrical impulses, and uh, biochemistry. So yes, there's a reasonable chance that, uh, that we might be able to build it. But, but will it understand itself any better than we do? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, thank you very much. I just want to mention before you leave that the series is going to continue February 8th. Dan Rockmore from uh, Dartmouth is going to talk about mathematics and art. And then we have two more coming up in the spring, one on gravity's cosmic shadows, that's gravitational lensing, and uh, then the brilliant magician turned statistician Percy Diaconis is going to talk about mathematics and magic tricks. We have a bunch of copies of the poster here, if you'd like to pick one up. <laughs> Your souvenir Phil Holmes does math matter to brain matter postcard. And for the students who need a certificate of attendance, there are some of those up here too. Thank you very much for tonight.